Elvis fans are all shook up about the long-awaited Elvis biopic, which was finally released in 2022 after first being announced in 2014. Australian director Baz Luhrmann's film premiered at Cannes, and it received a rave review by none other than Lisa Marie herself. Anyone who's seen a Baz Luhrmann film knows to expect a visually rich film and knows he isn't afraid to reimagine historical facts or put a new spin on some older music. Doja Cat contributed an original song for the film, and the soundtrack's gonna include some new versions of Elvis songs by artists as varied as Eminem to CeeLo Green to Stevie Nicks. And we know loyal fans of any iconic artist are purists who are going to love pointing out inaccuracies. But when it comes to Elvis Aaron Presley, we'll never find out where the facts end and the legend begins. Or will we? WH Stratton here with What Happened, and today we're excited to talk about Elvis. There is plenty to love about this film, but 2 hours and 39 minutes isn't nearly enough time to include everything. So we'll set the record straight about what's in the movie and what isn't. But before we take care of business, right? Make sure you hit the thumbs up button for us and subscribe to the channel so we can let you know about upcoming videos. But without further ado, one for the money, two for the show. Three to get ready, here we go, cat go, to show you. What, what happened? happened? Big blue suede shoes to fill. Elvis impersonation has become an art all unto itself, and 30-year-old Austin Butler dons the white jumpsuit in the title role. Of course, other actors were considered for the title role, including Ansel Elgort, Aaron Taylor Johnson, Miles Teller, and the old One Direction frontman and new sensation Harry Styles. But Butler was a good physical match for the king. And most critics agree that he handled Elvis's mannerisms well. Robbie Collin from The Telegraph gives Butler's performance a rave review and said that it's not a Presley impersonation so much as Presley via James Dean. But then you have Owen Gleiberman of Variety saying that Butler, quote, looks more like the young John Travolta crossed with Jason Priestley. Baz Luhrmann told Entertainment Weekly that he got a call from Denzel Washington recommending Austin Butler for the role. Denzel had worked with Butler on stage and said that the young actor had an amazing work ethic. We're not sure if that phone call iced the role for him, but we're pretty sure it did not hurt. A legend begins. There are some who'd make me out to be the villain of this here story. We'll be discussing the fat suit and the colonel's curious accent in more detail later. But the film's first act begins with a young boy in overalls peeking through the walls of a juke joint before he's magically lured by the sounds of a tent revival. Scenes with the young Elvis on stage at the hayride are juxtaposed with images of the even younger Elvis dancing and speaking in tongues. And cue the montage. Oh, we will be talking about Elvis Presley. Which features more crotch shots and more screaming gals. Elvis hits his first note and his pants puff up in response. And if this film isn't a hit, maybe Austin Butler can move on to a career as one of those inflatable guys. I am learning some amazing moves from this guy. <laughs> But the ladies go crazy, and the colonel sees dollar signs. I wish to promote you, Mr. Presley. The colonel. Colonel Parker narrates the story on his deathbed, and we finally get the chance to hear his side of the story. Now, Tom Hanks had already encountered Elvis in a previous film, but in a different setting. And we're really interested to see what he brings to the role. He's a real up-and-comer, this Tom Hanks. He's gonna be big. But Colonel Tom Parker wasn't really a colonel, and he also wasn't really a Tom. He was born Andreas Cornelius Van Kalk and immigrated to the U.S. from Holland at the age of 20. The trailer doesn't appear to whitewash any of the details of the controversial promoter. The real Colonel Parker didn't give many interviews, but Ted Koppel interviewed him on Nightline in 2007, 30 years after Elvis's death. Now, I'm not sure Tom has the voice down pat, but maybe it's the fat suit distracting me because it's pretty hard to unsee. <laughs> 
And the critics haven't been too kind to Hanks either. Justin Chang from the LA Times called his work, quote, hammy, grating, and unmodulated to a fault. Yikes. David Ehrlich from IndieWire said, quote, Colonel Parker's accent can only be described as the Kentucky Fried Gold member, further stating that he makes Jar Jar Binks no, not really, no, no. seem like Elliot Gould in The Long okay, Goodbye. Okay, okay, okay. Multiple critics have complained that too much effort is spent making Colonel Parker a leading character and that it pads out the runtime for the entire thing. He's a logical choice to narrate the film, but his scenes do come at the expense of developing the other characters, you know, like Elvis. The King meets B.B. King. Fellow Memphian B.B. King is portrayed by Kelvin Harrison Jr. and we see them interacting backstage. Some people want to put me in jail. The well's moving. They might put me in jail for walking across the street, but you're a famous white boy. Critics and music historians frequently claim that rock and roll appropriated the work of African-American artists, but B.B. King has stuck up for Elvis on several occasions. King said that rhythm and blues music has always been around, and anyone can add to it or take from it. Jackie Wilson also claimed that almost every black solo entertainer copied Elvis after the fact, too. And one thing they neglect to include are Elvis's country roots. But the King was an avid remixer and we're pretty sure he'd approve. The two artists didn't really travel in the same circles and they missed each other by a few years when they recorded music at Sun Studios. B.B. King and Ray Charles were headlining the 1956 Goodwill Review. And event organizers reached out to Elvis to perform at the All Black Show. But Elvis couldn't perform due to contractual obligations. But he appeared at the show to support his heroes. Rufus Thomas brought Elvis on stage for a guest appearance. And the crowd rushed the stage before Elvis was whisked away by police. The way he sings is God given, so there can't be nothing wrong with it. Changing Times Elvis's rise to stardom took place amidst a backdrop of social change, and we hear about the assassinations of both the Kennedy brothers in the film. The only problem was that Bobby wasn't shot at the same time as the taping of the 1968 comeback special. It has nothing to do with us. It has everything to do with us. The Martin Luther King Jr. assassination happened in Elvis's hometown, but we're not sure that Elvis and the Colonel ever actually had a lengthy discussion about it. They also conveniently gloss over Elvis's later opposition to hippies and the Black Panther Party, and only touched on Elvis's later paranoia in one brief conversation with Priscilla. And how could Lerman neglect to include the great meeting of Nixon and Elvis, when the King wanted to be sworn in as an undercover agent in the Bureau of Narcotics and Dangerous Drugs? It's all in the hips. Senator Jim Eastland is played by Nicholas Bell, and he definitely wants to harsh everyone's buzz. Enemy spotted. In 1956, a Florida judge ordered Elvis to tone down his act before a show in Jacksonville. I mean, come on, it's Jacksonville. You crashed your jet ski into a manatee? Yeah, I'm from Jacksonville, Florida. That happens a lot. Elvis maliciously complied with the judge's order by standing still during most of his performance, but he defiantly waved his finger at the crowd. Elvis's hip gyration was highly controversial in the 1950s, and Ed Sullivan announced his intentions to shoot tight to hide his downstairs movements. It turned out to be an empty threat, because Elvis was actually shown head to toe for most of his first two appearances on the show. But it's understandable because prior to Elvis, Sing. Glenn Miller was about as edgy as it got. Priscilla. Australian actor Olivia de Jong played Priscilla, and singer Lana Del Rey was reportedly considered for the role. Never met anyone like you. Priscilla is a very key figure in Elvis's story, but she doesn't get much screen time in this flick. Variety's Owen Gleiberman said that de Jong registers strongly in an early scene, but scarcely has the chance to color in her performance. David Ehrlich from IndieWire says, quote, She skips from army brat to shrewish mom without stopping to land anywhere in between. Viva Las Vegas! 
Our film's final act features Elvis moving to Vegas and signing his life away. His luxury penthouse becomes a cage, and he turned to drugs to cope. We are treated to several more lavish production numbers and plenty of Christ symbolism as we see our hero fight his way through crowds and cast his arms wide. Heck, the Colonel's VO even proclaims him to be a god. What's not there? Despite the criticisms about the movie's runtime, the film seems to leave out many significant and well-known details about Elvis's life. For starters, they must assume we've all taken the tour of Graceland, because we only get some establishing shots. We also hear Elvis's reaction to MLK's death, but very little about his mother, who was such an influential figure in his life. Priscilla is kind of a minor character in this story. And bye-bye to Anne Margaret, she's not even included at all. Their affair was the world's worst kept secret. But I suppose that if Priscilla barely made the cut, and Margaret didn't stand a chance. So if you like montages, you're gonna love this film. It's a convenient way to pass large amounts of time quickly, and the movie moves so quickly that it can hardly keep up. Most of the 1960s transpire in two minutes of montage, and Elvis's film career is summarized in a single line of dialogue. Trust me. The film also uses plenty of split-screen shots and smash cuts, and even though the film leaves out a lot, you'll probably have to view it several times if you want to see everything that's included. Baz throws a lot at you. During an interview with Entertainment Weekly, Baz said that Elvis's life fits beautifully into a three-act pop cultural opera. We begin with Elvis the punk, and then we transition into Elvis the movie man as we finish up with the wretched excess of the 70s. Lerman jokingly considered the movie the apocalypse now of musicals. Elvis's daughter Lisa Marie praised the film on Instagram, calling it, quote, nothing short of spectacular. She said that Austin Butler channeled and embodied my father's heart and soul beautifully, and that his performance is unprecedented and finally done accurately and respectfully. She concludes by thanking him for setting the record straight in such a deeply profound and artistic way. There's a lot of people saying a lot of things. And says that Baz Luhrmann's utter genius, combined with his love and respect for her father, is, quote, just so beautiful and so inspiring. So thank you, thank you very much for joining us today. And get in the comments and tell me your thoughts on the trailers. Are you excited for this film? How do you think this one's gonna stack up against other Baz Luhrmann films? Get in the comments and tell us all. And if you don't mind, please smash that thumbs up icon and subscribe to the channel. Come back often so we can keep telling you what happened. happened.